We moving? Microphone moving? All righty. Um, let's open up our Bibles to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. I'm going to probably, let's read this little passage here. Philippians chapter 3, verse, starting in verse 13. Philippians 3, 13 through 21. Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, brethren, Apostle Paul writing, I count not myself to have apprehended. All right, in other words, I don't got everything figured out. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I like that. That's one of the things Paul says, I don't got it all figured out, but if there was one thing that I'd say, if there's one piece of advice I'd give you, forgetting those things which are behind. That's a good thing. And pressing forward, pressing towards, not backsliding or just being stagnant or, you know, remaining, but pressing forward. Then he goes on in verse 15. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. And if in anything ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Well, that's a good one. I mean, you know, one of the biggest things is how is you look around all the divisions in Christianity and he says one thing, they say all, you know, he says another thing, obviously, because we're not all on the same page. So if we're all to be with the same mind, we're all to be of the same role, well, then we ought to have the same standard of absolute truth. I mean, that should be common sense. Then verse 17, brethren, be followers together of me. And Paul instructs them to follow Follow him and mark them which walk so as he have us for an example. Everybody that Paul taught, they followed Paul. And Paul said, look, there's other people out there that, that, that followed me and my doctrine, so therefore mark them and, and follow them. And you have us as an example and, and sample. For many walk, now look at this part, verse 18 to 21. For many walk, of whom I have told you often. Remember we did that Bible study a while ago on many Okay, you know, it's always, it's always going to be many. Many are going to fall away, many deceivers, many false Christs. You're always going to see that, you know, God in the, in the latter days really is always a small little remnant of just little Bible-believing nobodies. You know, there's always a small little remnant. God deals with, with the few individuals. Now, there's going to be many walk of whom I've told you often and now I even tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross of Christ. I think we studying that passage of that verse for a minute, you know, you could say, okay, well, they're enemies of the cross of Christ. In other words, they want nothing to do with the cross of Christ. They want nothing to do with salvation. Or they're enemies of the cross of Christ. They're just a bunch of, you know, lukewarm Christians or whatever, or just, yeah, I don't care about taking up my cross and, you know, dying to myself and, and not fulfilling my desires and affections and sacrificing myself and my will for His will. So you could say, well, it's either they're lost or they just don't want to live a, a changed life after they're saved, you know, live, live in accordance to the Holy Spirit. But either way, which is clear, is they're enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. Ain't that something? They glory in their shame. So that would give me an idea that, okay, these people are probably lost. And that's one of the sure signs of, okay, you're saved. Yeah, you're still going to sin, but what's your attitude towards the sin? You're not going to try justifying it. You're not going to try to find your way around it and with all these weird exceptions and stuff to try to justify your sin. You're going to own up to it and say, no, it's sin. I'm wrong. I'm sorry. You know, if you sin against a brother, confess it to the brother. You sin to others, confess it to them. Obviously, confess it to God. But there's people that glory in their shame who mind earthly things. Okay, so there's one group of people. Notice that's in parentheses. Okay, verses 18, 19, and verse 20. For our conversation is in heaven from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not to get off on a whole other topic here, but we're still to look for the Savior. You know, you're hearing people, well, he's not going to be coming back for another five years, six years. or You know, I still believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, meaning he'd come back at any moment. People, now people are saying, well... You know, the Mark of the Beast system got to get instituted and the temple got to be rebuilt. What are we to look for? 
Are we to look for Jesus Christ or are we to look for the new world order set up and the man of sin to show up on a scene and the mark of the beast system all you know fit in place? Or what are we to look for? We're to look for Jesus Christ. Okay, so not to get our eyes off of that like ah, he's going to delay his coming. I don't, I don't want to be that servant that, that the Lord said ah, he delays his coming and eats and drinks with the drunkards and stuff. We're to look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And what's he going to do? He's going to change our vile body. Our vile body that may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Now what I want to zone in on tonight is whose glory is in their shame who mind earthly things. Alright now, could you guys guess what the most dangerous place in America is? We have to take a guess. The most dangerous place in America. Most dangerous city? Most dangerous place in general. Most dangerous place of all. Church. Church is pretty dangerous. There's a lot of churches out there that are dangerous. How about this? A mother's womb. That's one of the most dangerous places, obviously. You know, people think, well, Chicago, Detroit, Baltimore. But obviously, a mother's womb is, is a dangerous place to be in these days. So what I'm going to talk about, if you want to write down a title for tonight's study, we're going to be talking about what does God think on abortion. I feel like, you know, Lord, I, I, had, I had to do a Bible study on this. You know, like, okay, Lord, get me back to square one on this thing and, and let me know what, what's going on with this whole deal. And I did find it interesting that I learned also that now, this thing got overturned on 6 24 2022. So it happened to be at 6 24, that's 6, 2022, there's 6 again. Now it's probably just a coincidence though, but who, know, you know, who knows? You know, with all this numerology stuff, uh, it's pretty interesting. But yeah, Mother's Womb today in this day and age is pretty dangerous to be in. I'm going to try to give some statistics and stuff. Um, 1990, there was 1.6 million abortions. All right, and I get this stuff from, I don't know, the CDC in Goot, I don't even know how to pronounce it, Gootmacher Goot, Goot Institute. 1990, there was 1.6 million abortions. All right, and then now, 2020, uh, 930,000 abortions. Okay, murders. Babies being killed. And I looked up the, what's the... Uh, how many homicides were there in 2020? 24,000 homicides. So it's fair to say that the most dangerous place to be in America is inside of the mother's womb. I mean, that's insane when you think of it. 24,000 homicides. Next thing you know, there's 930,000 babies being killed. So I want to look at what does God say about abortion. And there's a particular group of people out there that they glory in something that's shameful. They glory in their shame. And, uh, and, and there's an agenda, obviously, that you probably all are well aware of, that there's a, an agenda that's straight-up anti-Republican, straight-up anti-conservative, straight-up anti-capitalist. Uh, anti and, um, you know, at the end of the day, they're pretty much just anti-Christ. All right? And I'm not going to get too far into the politics of, of this all, but it's a, there's a clear agenda out there that, that you could see all that. And... More so what we got to really look out for and compare things. There's an agenda that's anti-Bible, and there's an agenda that's against our Lord. When you're against the Bible, you're against God's written word, you're against this King James Bible, well, then you're obviously against God, so you're anti-God. Because this book, after all, contains every word of the Lord is pure, correct? You either believe that or you don't believe that. You know, and, and it's sad to say that we're living in an age that Christians even do not believe in a pure, perfect, and errant word of God. It just boggles my mind. You know, I mean, really. Now, I've been saying this to you guys for a long time. Every single thing that goes on in this world, everything that goes on in your life and your experiences that you're going through and your troubles and affairs, whatever you're going through in life, you want to consult God's book. I think I was just reading the book of Psalms. It might have been Psalm chapter 119 about how the words of God are his counselors. That's our counsel. So I want to see counsel. What does God say about, what does he say about abortion? Okay? And I'm going to consult what God says about it because I don't want, I'm not concerned so much, well, what does the right-wing media say about it? What does the left-wing media say about it? And what do you think about it? And, you know, what do you think about it? I don't want your opinions. I don't want their opinions. I don't want, you know, John Paul had an interesting thing about his opinion. I don't want John Paul's opinion. I want God's opinion about the matter. You know what I'm saying? Because people get all thrown up about, ah, it's just your opinion. We'll push everybody's opinion aside, media and all, and we're to consult our final authority. And more so, this is probably a study that's directed towards Christians. So, you know, a Christian should, should go along with this. But you're, 
you know, you'd be surprised in a sense of uh, how many liberal, ultra-liberal churches are preaching that, no, you know, women, women's rights. And, you know, this is like, this is like, they're like upset about it. They're flipping out because of this whole thing that just got overturned. I mean, that's like, I mean, I don't understand, you know, how, how you could go along with that and, you know, go along with Christ, you're a Christian, and yet be okay with something like that. It's wrong. And people are going to do it. People say, pro-choice. Pro pro you have a choice. Yeah, you, you want to go commit a drug or you want to go commit a sin? You have the choice to do it, but it's wrong. <laughs> you know, everybody has, has a choice. Everybody has a free will. But some of the choices that we obviously make is wrong, okay? Now I'm going to start off in Genesis chapter 16. Now, first thing, my first point is there is a word in our vocabulary that's, that, that is worthy of us to just knock out of our vocabulary. Okay, we are taught this word in secular schools. We're taught this in the medical field. And here's a word in a, in a Bible-believing Christian's vocabulary that should just be taken out, and it's the word pregnant. Now, if, we, if it would do well for us all to just cut out that word pregnant, don't ever say it again. And you're going to see why once we continue on with these verses. Look at Genesis chapter 16, verse 11. This will establish our grounds for what does God think about abortion? What does He think about this, um, about this subject here? So, Genesis 16... Verse 11. Genesis 16, verse 11. Now, before I even read this verse, if people would just get that word out of their vocabulary, if the media would, have, would get that word pregnant out of their vocabulary, if the secular schools would get that word and they would constantly say what the Bible says, then people would have a complete different mentality of, should I abort this baby here? Look at Genesis 16, 11. First mention... Uh, Genesis chapter 16. And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child. Thou art with child, and shall bear a son. Thou shalt call him his name Ishmael, because the Lord hath heard thy affliction. There goes the first mention of a woman, what's it say? With child. Okay, woman with child. The word with child shows up in our King James Bible 26 times. Shows up 26 times. That's any time God wants to deal with a pregnant woman, pregnant woman, he says with child. Now right away, that it would do well for us to knock out that word pregnant from our vocabulary. Because automatically, um, when you, uh, now let me just read a couple verses real quick here. Gen NIV, Genesis 16, 11, pregnant. ESV, Bible. Pregnant. New Living Translation says pregnant. New American Standard Bible says pregnant. Go look up. Go look up all these references. They take out with child and replace it with pregnant. A pregnant woman or a woman with child. Well, I see two people. Woman with child. A pregnant woman. Now, it's just all about the woman. You just completely took out that other person. <laughs> now, do you see how subtle that the devil is on something like that? Most Christians would come across something like that and say, that's not a big deal. But, you know, what do you mean it's not a big deal? You're changing God's words. And that's the mentality that, that even Christians have, that that's not another person. That's not another life. Now, could you imagine, let's go look at Ecclesiastes chapter 6. Could you imagine the media, could you imagine being taught in school that, um, well, uh, you know, so-and-so is pregnant. No, no, so-and-so is with child. Or did you hear about my wife? She's with child. Or, you know, the, this, this woman's with child. Or this famous woman, she's with child. If they constantly put that, that phrase out to the people, woman with child, woman with child, then you would have no question about, well, is it wrong to kill that child? You know, so you could just see all, all, just already that, that pregnant, okay, they think pregnant. That's not, that's not the Bible way of, of doing things. It's not the Bible way of saying it. There's two people. Look at Ecclesiastes. 11.5. Ecclesiastes 11.5. As thou knowest not what is the way of the Spirit, nor how the bones do grow in the womb of her that is with child. Her, one person, with child, another person. Even so thou knowest not the works of God, who maketh all. I don't know how in the world God <laughs> makes these bones, and this thing grows, and cells, and you know, God makes all that stuff. People say, well, that we could explain it with science. You just got a bunch of terms on what you're observing. You really 
can't figure that thing out, how this matter just grows. And God is a part of all that. God is a part of, of creating things, and you know, obviously. Um, but it says woman with child. All right, looked up NIV. It says pregnant woman. Amplified, Amplified Bible, pregnant woman. Christian Standard Bible, pregnant woman. NASB, pregnant woman. They take out all these, in all these references of woman with child, it's just a pregnant woman. I mean, that's, that's odd. Uh, Luke chapter 2, verse 5. Luke chapter 2, verse 5. And people are so conditioned to hearing pregnant woman, pregnant woman, that now all of a sudden they don't even, they think that that, that, that thing in, the, in her womb is not even a person. That's not a child. It's just a fetus. It's just an embryo. It's just a, you know, it, it, I heard one, it's just a parasite living off of a host. I mean, you know, no, it's a woman with child. That's what it is, okay? And it's a life. Look at Luke chapter 2, verse 5. Luke 2, 5. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. She's being great with child. You know, many people say she's really pregnant. Like, you know, she's about to, about to well, no, she's great with child. Okay, it was, say something like that. She's great with child. Once again, with child. Not Mary's pregnant. Okay, no, Mary, has, there's, a, there's a child in there. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, same thing. I thought this one, you know, we're usually all familiar with Thessalonians, you know, the then sudden destruction cometh upon them as a woman travail with child, you know. And, they, and you read the, the New King James, even, pregnant woman. NIV, pregnant woman. ESV, pregnant woman. It just don't even, it don't even sound right. 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child. So there's the point. It's a woman with child. And this should be, a, 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 first off, a simple, basic argument, especially dealing with other Christians about, no, nah, I, I think it's right. You mean tell me you think it's right to, to there's a child in the woman. It's not just a pregnant woman. That's not just a, just a you know, just a, 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 an amoeba or, or an embryo. It's, it's, a, it's a child. It's a life. Now, um, you know that that's one of the reasons why society doesn't see that abortion is murder because they don't look at you know they don't look at the baby as it being a child. Now, I already said though, if just the world in general just was was constantly bombarding the minds of people with that phrase, with that King James Bible phrase, with child, then you could see how people would have a different outlook from it. Now, these are just like words like well, you know, sex. You know, well, it's fornication. This would be just like words like sodomy. You know, uh, it's homosexuality. Or sin nowadays, it's no more sin. Sin isn't sin, it's, it's a disorder. <laughs> you know, obviously, this would fall into the whole realm of being, you know, political correct speech and stuff. And they, they just don't want to tell it like, it like it is, okay? Now, you know, sooner or later they're going to say, well, it's not, it's, it's a pregnant person, you know? And then, yeah, pregnant person, because now men could, a uh, men, right. And it's not going to be Mother's Day, it's going to be Person's Day. <laughs> I mean, this is how far this thing is getting. I mean, that's in the, in the new Bibles. You better believe the devil has infiltrated the, the new versions of every single scripture out there, beside the King James Bible. It has infiltrated that and changed things slightly, and it preconditions people. Oh, that's not even a child no more. I think it's I think it's right. You know, I mean, that's what happens. You mess with God's word. Let's look at Numbers chapter five twenty one. We're going to see an interesting verse here, and I'm going to show you what the modern Bibles actually advocate God for aborting a baby. They're saying, this is a verse, you're going to see how, how much of a drastic change this is, but they'll be like, no, you know, well, no, this is good. This is, the, uh, this is, in a sense, God saying, yeah, good, get an abortion. He's going to kill the baby inside of you. Look at Numbers chapter 521. Then the priest shall charge the woman with an oath of cursing. And the priest shall say unto the woman, The Lord make thee a curse and an oath among thy people, when the Lord doth make thy thigh to rot, and thy belly to swell. Now this is the thing about, okay, look, did you cheat on me? No, I didn't cheat on you. Okay, I'm going to take you to my priest. Okay, it's back Old Testament Jewish law. I'm going to take you to the priest. The priest is going to make you drink this thing. And if you, and if you told a lie, it's like a modern day, I think Dr. Ruckman has a note on it. There's a modern day lie detector test. If you took, the, if you took this drink, then... And, you're, and it caused those things, well, you cheated on me, okay? And if, and if it didn't, well, then, okay, you were telling the truth type of thing here, okay? 
But just note, though, the Lord make thy thigh. The, who's making it? The Lord doth make thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. Now, this is one in the Christian, uh, or this is the NIV first. Here the priest is to put the woman under this curse. May the Lord cause you to become a curse among your people when he makes your womb miscarry in your abdominal swell. Your womb miscarry. The Lord is going to make you have a miscarriage, okay? He's, in other words, he'll you know, kill the baby, per se. Numbers 5.27 in the Christ, uh, CEB. I don't, I don't know what that is. When he make her drink the water, if she had defiled herself and broken, broken faith with her husband, then the water that brings the curse will enter her, causing bitterness, and her womb will discharge, and she will miscarry. The woman will be a curse. So there's a couple of translations that say, look, you know, you go to this, and God's going to make that womb to miscarry. Well, there's clearly, you would say there's a big difference with making the thigh to rot and thy belly to swell compared to her womb will discharge and she will miscarry. I mean, could you, you know, could you see the difference there? There's a difference. You say, well, what's that mean? Or make her thigh to rot. I don't know what that means. <laughs> That's just what it says. It's her thigh is going to rot or her belly to swell. And if you want an updated version of the, the GNT translation, her stomach will swell up and her general organs will shrink. Her name will be a curse among the people. <laughs> I mean, I don't know how they get, you know, they, they get thigh with, with something like that. Um, whenever her stomach will swell, her uterus will drop and she will become a curse among her people. I mean, you can see that it's almost like, you know, that it's almost like they're taking it to the priest and the priest is doing this thing and God's allowing this miscarriage to happen, okay, and, and making that happen. But, you know, that's, a, that's a, a, subtle, a subtle thing where, you know, it's like, it's like the modern day, uh, that would be like the modern day uh, abortion thing. Well, I'm going to go to the abortion clinic and, and the priest is like the abortion doctor and you do this thing and the priest is going to give you this drink and you're going to have a miscarriage and abort, the, in a sense, abort that baby. Well, no, don't, it don't say that. Don't have to do with that. It's making thy thigh to rot and thy belly to swell. Because people would use that verse right there in other translations and say, well, see, Look what the Lord instructed the priest to do right here. Pretty much kill the baby by making her drink poison. So thing miscarriages or whatever. So that's not what it says. Now, another thing I want to talk about is does a baby have a soul? Okay, so look at Luke chapter Luke chapter 1, verse 41. Well, we already determined in the Bible that it says a woman with child. All right, well, let's, if we stay logical with that, if it's a woman with child, does a child have a soul? Does a child have a soul? Well, sure it does. Now, I'm not going to get hung up on, okay, well, what's he going to look like in eternity? And, you know, these are like some questions like the Sadducees would ask Jesus Christ. You know, the guy had seven wives, and they all died, and this next brother took his wife, and she took his wife. Whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? And the Lord looked, and I'm like, you're crazy. You're coming up with these big scenarios. I'm not concerned with what's this, you know, an embryo, a fetus and stuff, or he's in the womb this big. If that thing dies or whatever, they, they abort it that size. What's he going to be up in eternity? I don't know what he's going to be in eternity, but there's a soul. All I know is if there's a seed, and okay, let's say that thing was tiny. You plant a seed, that thing's probably going to be, the, that's probably going to be a regular person when you get up there into eternity. Probably. You want to get a little step farther, it'll probably look like a 33-year-old male or whatever. Okay, so it'll probably still have a, be a person. It'll probably have an identity. It's not going to remain an embryo for the rest of eternity. It's not going to remain a baby, a nine, eight month, eight month old baby for the rest of eternity. I would doubt that, okay? But let's look at, look at, look at Luke chapter 1, verse 41. Came to pass, okay, um, it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay, the babe leapt in the womb. Uh, now look at this, verse 44. Salutation of my, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Now, I think there's a little key there with joy, okay? Now, when you really think of it, joy is an emotion. Where does true joy come from? It comes from the Lord. I mean, geez, I never knew really what true joy was until I got born again. Then I understood true joy and joy in the Holy Ghost, joy in the comfort 
of the God of the universe loving me enough to come down dying for my sins because I knew I was a sinner, resurrecting the third day, finishing it all, paying it all, sealing me with the Holy Spirit, giving me assurance of salvation, therefore I can have joy in my soul. Uh, Psalms 35.9, just a little thing on joy. And I think that's interesting. Joy, that's an, it's an emotion. The baby had an emotion. Now that's John the Baptist. Now let me get this across. No, not every baby is ordained to be a John the Baptist. <laughs> no. Nor every baby, you know, come out, you know, filled with the Holy Ghost and stuff like that. I, un I, I understand that. Let's look at Psalms, though. Just talking about this joy here for a minute. Look at Psalms 35. Look at Psalms 35, verse number 9. Psalms 35, 9. Look what David says. My soul shall be joyful in the Lord. It shall rejoice in His salvation. Well, that's pretty much what little baby John the Baptist was. His joy was in was in the Lord. Was, and obviously, salvation was in, the, and was in the belly of Mary. Now, how he knew that, I have no idea, but he leapt for joy, okay? Um, and, and joy, I think, is, found, is something that is found within the soul of a person. Look at, look at Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61, verse 10. I will greatly rejoice... In the Lord, my soul shall be joyful in my God. And then he goes on, why, why is your soul that inner joy that you should have always? I'm not talking about being happy and always smiling and laughing and giggling. That's, that's different. That's, ex, that's stuff that just happened in a moment of time, experience and happiness, happened in a moment of, 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 of time. But there, here's where joy is. He clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decked himself with ornaments. And as a bride adorneth herself with jewels. We joy in, in God's salvation, obviously. That's true joy. That thing should be, should be always there in the midst of, regardless of anything that you're, that you're going through. You've got to have joy, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Now, joy is in the soul. Now, uh, Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Now, it's interesting. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. Okay, not every single mother out there is filled with the Holy Ghost, okay? But um, I, I, I understand that. Now, Galatians 5.22, we, we all know this one. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Well, that baby had one of the fruits of the Spirit right in the womb. He leapt for joy. Um, Colossians 2, verse 5, Paul's Spirit is joying in the Corinthians about their faith in Christ. So joy is found in Christ. Joy is, is, is found in the soul, okay, in other places. And only a person, come to 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, 3, only a person, is it a person? Well, the Bible says it's a woman with child. Well, so look at 1 Thessalonians 5, look at verse 23. Sanctify you holy, I pray God, your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless. Okay, yeah, that's talking to a Christian. You're obviously not going to be blameless, body, soul, and spirit, but that's, that role still applies to everybody out there. Every person out there has a body, a soul, and a spirit. You get born again, what gets saved, what gets regenerated, what gets brought back to life, your spirit does. And that regenerates your spirit, then therefore your body or your soul and spirit saved, but our body obviously is not saved until the rapture, okay? We get our incorruptible bodies, but... Body, soul, and spirit, the child, leapt for joy. Joy is found in the soul. Joy is found in the Lord. All right, next thing, let's look at Exodus 21. Is it murder? Is it murder? Now, we're going to go through this thing. Look at Exodus 21. Exodus 21. And, um, and we'll see once again, right here there's going to be a judgment on killing the... Uh, killing a, a child that's inside of a mother's womb. There's going to be a judgment on it. We're going to read the King James Bible, and then we're going to see a couple other translations where they take the judgment out of it. So when they're, once again, they're, you know, they already they already made it look like God was for abortion when the priest gave that woman something to drink and it caused her to miscarry. Then there's going to see a punishment has to deal with 
uh, if you kill a, a, a child inside of a woman, there's a punishment associated. Well, they take out the punishment. So you can see how already new translations, that pick, pick any one of them, they're slightly leaning towards, you know, pregnant woman or slightly getting rid of, rid of that child, that innocent life, okay? So, and then, yeah, it's not murder. There's no punishment associated with it. Look at Exodus 21, verse 22. If men strive and hurt a woman with child, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief fall, uh, yet no mischief follow. Okay, and it was probably accident. No mischief follow. It was an accident. Uh, look what it says. Um, so that her fruit depart from her, and yet no mischief follow. He shall surely be punished. So you're still gonna. You, you, you know, you're, okay, it was an accident, but you still got to pay for that still, okay? He shall surely be punished according, look at this though, according as the woman's husband will lay upon him. Notice that it's not even the woman that's in charge of this punishment. The man has a say in it. I'll, I'm going to decide that's my child that you just, you, you, you know, men strive. They were fighting, whatever they were doing. You caused my woman, uh, my, my wife, to, the, our baby to, to depart. I'll decide what the judgment is. Notice it's in the hands, the woman's body, in a sense, is in the hands of the husband. He decides what that punishment shall be. According as the woman's husband will lay upon him, he shall pay as the judges determine. And if any mischief follow, meaning that, that was probably, um, what do they call it, premeditated, or that was probably on purpose, okay, it was not an accident. If any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Well, yeah, that requires the death penalty. You killed, you took a life in my in my wife. You made that my, our baby to depart, and you intentionally did it. Well, yeah, you got to die. My wife's living, but okay, but you pushed her against the wall and caused my baby to die. We got to go take you out. We got to have capital punishment, whatever the method was. That's capital punishment. I'm all for capital punishment. Okay, now that's you know that's that's one thing now. Now here's what you know. Um, we're gonna. I don't want to get too ahead of myself. Let me just read a. Um, Read a couple uh, versions here. English Standard Version. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman. You know, there it goes again. Hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out. So, so that her children come out, but there is no harm. The one who hit her shall be surely fined, and the woman shall impose, and the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as a judge determined. No, what do you mean, so that her children come out? I mean, you know, that's kind of, you know, watery there. Well, what's that mean there? If people are fighting and hit a pregnant woman, here's the NIV, and she gives birth prematurely, but there's no serious injury, gives birth prematurely, so they're saying right there, the baby came out. I mean, you could be premature and still live, right? Okay, well, if she gives birth prematurely, but there's no serious injury, the offender must be fined, whatever the husband, what a woman's husband determines in court. Now, once again, the new versions do not give judgment for if the woman's fruit departs from her. It's, it dies, a life for life. Something just died there. The child died. Not that there's, I think there's a big difference of the fruit departs, life for life, compared to children come out, but there's no harm, or a premature birth. Well, it's saying, well, maybe the, the child didn't die. You know, it's like, what do you mean by that? Um, now, today, obviously, the laws know that. If someone kills a woman, yeah, they, okay, if someone kills a woman and the woman's with child, well, then they're going to get charged with double homicide. You killed a woman and you killed a child, okay? The a law, the law would know that, um, you know, and, and, and even a, 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 the, a woman also can go, uh, can go down, you know, uh, a nine-month-old baby, because she'd go down in the name of, of social rights and, 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 you know, my rights, she'd go down to an abortion clinic have that baby killed and yet all of a sudden it's not murder i mean it's just another common logic i'm sure we all are familiar with that um but yet that same woman she can go and throw her baby away in the dumpster and yet they catch her while she's charged with murder but if she goes down the does it the a right way and goes down an abortion clinic let's say eight months or nine months whatever eight months or forcibly does it whatever um well that's not really it's not really murder you're not taking a life you're taking a life regardless of of what it is and what uh how it's done, okay? Now, if we were under the Old Testament law, right, we would kill the one that kills the baby. Now, here's where, you know, some of the, 
uh, some confusion would, would get brought about. Well, people say, well, you know, if you really believe that, then you would be out there killing all the abortion doctors. Well, look, we're under the New Testament. All right, that, that vengeance, God's going to take vengeance upon those people. I'm not going to go out there and kill. Well, it says, look, life for life, so follow the law throughout the whole. That's what, that's what some people would say, though. Okay, well, it's life for life, so, you know, then follow it out to, the, to a T. No, no, we could understand instruction and righteousness, that there's a punishment associated with it, but we're not to continue to follow out through with the whole rest of the law. Okay, let me, let me try to clean this up a little bit. Like sodomy and adultery. Well, it says in the Old Testament you're to kill them. But yet all pre preachers were all, you know, sodomy is, is still a sin, and so is adultery, still a sin, but there's no capital punishment associated with it. Well, it's the same thing with the, with, with the with that, killing a baby, that's still a sin, but I'm not going to go out there and kill the abortion doctor. You know, so I, I hope, hope that's kind of, I uh, hope that's clear in a sense. Um, now, because this gets into, my, into the next thing, you know, people will say, well, look, Dr. Peter Ruckman, he teaches that abortion is murder. You ever read his notes? You ever read some of his notes? It's, it's not a life. And I checked the thing on the, the, the uh, his Ruckman's Reference Bible, 2009. Okay, that's 2009. I could find the same clip preaching in Dr. Peacock's church where he says that killing a child is, it's murder. He says, thou shalt not kill, uh, thou shalt not kill born or unborn. Okay, so he'll get into this whole thing. Well, it's not really... Um, it's not really a, a, um, a life. It's not really done. The child doesn't have a, have a soul until God breathes air. Okay, so now we say, where do you get that from? He goes back to Adam. All right, now God, breathed, God formed Adam from the dust of the ground, uh, breathed into, uh, formed from dust of the ground. There's his body, breathed into his nostrils. Okay, there's the spirit, and Adam became a living soul. So from the moment that God breathed into that, into the nostrils, so, you know, Dr. Ruckman in 2009, okay, he taught that, look, when that baby don't breathe its first breath, then it doesn't have a soul yet. Now I'd have to disagree, and who knows, maybe late in 2015 he preached that sermon in Dr. Peacock's church. I mean, maybe he changed his stance on it. But the point at the end of the day is, look, I'm still in subjection to God's word. I mean, look, Praise the Lord for, for Dr. Peter Ruckman. I, I owe a lot that I, you know, owe a lot to him. But the guy was off. He's a guy. He's a man. And I was like what, you know, what Sam Gitt would say. If he, surely he got to be off somewhere. Because <laughs> if he wasn't off somewhere, then that guy is God. <laughs> I mean, surely he got to be wrong somewhere. So, and I think that's one of the things that, that God allows men to be wrong somewhere. Okay? Now, whereas, you know, maybe he got that thing cleaned up at the, at the end of his life and said, because he said, thou shalt not kill a baby, born or unborn, thou shalt not kill. Well, that's that'd be murder. So you know, who knows? Uh, maybe change his, uh, his his thing on that. But you know, what what some of his notes would say is, well, they don't carry out the full punishment for it. Well, yeah, but we still preach against sodomy and we still preach against adultery, and we don't carry out the full punishment of that either. You get what I'm saying? So there's still a there's still an element that yes, that's wrong, that's sin, just because we're you know, I'm not going to go out there and kill people because they, because they do that. Now, Deuteronomy 27, Deuteronomy 27, 25, Deuteronomy 27, 25, Deuteronomy 27, Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person. Now I would hold that the Bible says woman with child, the child's a person. Cursed be he that taketh reward. That's a doctor getting paid for killing another person. What's it say? Cursed be that guy. And all the people shall say amen. <laughs> yeah, we shall all agree with that. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a cursed thing. And that, and that guy's getting paid to do that? <laughs> You know, that's a, that should be a cursed thing. We should all be in the same mind of that. Look at Deuteronomy um, 18, 9 through 14. Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. Look what it says here. Deuteronomy 18. So if you're going to write notes down, write down, I'd write down all these verses. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, verse 9. Let's see here. 
Verse 9. When thou come into the land of the Lord thy God, give it thee. Thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. Now I've heard, I've yet to do my own research on it, but I've heard that a lot of the, uh, the forms of abortion, where did this kind of start, like who kind of started doing this stuff? Supposedly that stuff was traced back to Egypt. The Egyptians, no, I'm talking like actual abortions. Oh. Like them actually doing like a, an abortion to a woman, I don't want this child or whatever. I got knocked up from some, you know, some slave or some other person that's not in the royal line. I don't want to be caught with this. And supposedly in the, in the Egyptian, the Egyptians would practice this form of, I'm going to pull this baby, I'm going to abort it. So I'm not so sure about that. I have to do some more research on it, but I just heard that. But it would be interesting to think, though, that thou shalt not learn to do after those, these abominations of those nations. I can't imagine the Israelites, even in the wilderness, you know, them having children and going somewhere in, in the thing and having them perform a barbaric uh, abortion. They, God's people didn't do that. Verse 10, There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or daughter to pass through the fire, or that uses divination or observer of times, or an enchanter or a witch or a charmer, or a consulter of familiar spirits, or a wizard or a necromancer, for all these are, are an abomination unto the Lord. And because these abominations of the Lord, the Lord thy God, drive them out before thee, thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. For these nations which shall possess hearkened unto, look, this is what they listen to, observer of times, unto, uh, unto diviners. But as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to do so. The Lord didn't want him to do that. Okay, and he talked about there passing the seed through fire. And yes, I understand that's, that's a... A born, a baby born, they just pop out this baby and they go right down to the, the pagans did it and they would sacrifice that child, you know, on the altar of their false god in this innocent life. Look at this verse in Amos. Amos chapter 1, verse number 13. But that'd be the same thing though, you know. What makes that, that child any different when it's in the womb that when it's going to be, uh, even be birthed and sacrificed or I'm just going to, Kill it while it's in the womb. It's still, it's still killing. All right, look at Amos chapter 1. Amos chapter 1, verse 13. Amos 1, 13. Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of the children of Ammon, and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof. Look at this. Because they have ripped up the woman with child of Gilead, that they may enlarge their border. I will kindle a fire. Okay, the Lord's given judgment about her. He goes on, I will send a fire. I will send a fire within that context. But notice there, for one of those particular things, where the Lord judges for, uh, about punishment, he calls, it, he calls it a transgression, that people have ripped up the woman with child. Not just ripping up a woman, but killing a woman and child, it's a transgression. Now, you can, I can see that, okay, it's talking about the woman and child, but it's just interesting to note that there's a transgression there associated with a woman and child getting ripped up, okay? Um, now, here's another thing. So, is the unborn fetus, which isn't a Bible word, um, that's why, you know, many, we're living in a day and age where many professing Christians, they're, they're quick to run to science, in philosophy, to develop their whole their line of belief. That's what Christians are, are doing. And that's why Paul warns about science and philosophy in his writings to the church age. Okay, um, And that's what they're quick to run to. Oh, it's an embryo, it's a fetus, it's, a, you know, it's not really a person yet. It, it's in that stage and all these, these you know, they, they make it real complicated and everything. Look at Genesis chapter 9 verse 4. I don't think God wanted that to be that complicated. You know what I mean? I mean, like, I didn't think God wanted it to be, well, what is life? You know, one of them old questions on philosophers would ask. What constitutes life? You know, what, what exactly is life? Because um, people say, well, it don't have a conscience yet. It don't think yet. It don't, I mean, I used to know all these other things, like debating in classrooms with, in, in religious history class about these, these issues and stuff. And, you know, um, I don't know what they say. Well, you know, don't have, well, neither does a handicapped person, or neither does a mentally disabled person, or some people don't have those things, and you know, uh, they don't, they don't, you know, what are you, you going to kill them too? We're going to kill them because they, they don't, they don't got a 
they're not in the right mind or they're, they're deformed or something's wrong with them. Well, if you were an evolutionist and you were, you know, a Nazi Adolf Hitler follower, well, then, yeah, sure, go, follow, go kill them then. <laughs> you know, I mean, the natural selection, you know, that's the whole theory of Darwinism. Well, look at Genesis 9, verse 4. Here's one of the first mentions of this, Genesis 9, 4. But flesh with the life thereof, which is the blood thereof. Shall you not eat? So right away, there's a, there has a... Okay, I'm not talking about, you know... If we're just talking about, is that... It, what constitutes life, it has something to do with blood. Okay? Something to do with blood. Look at Leviticus. Leviticus 17. Another definition. Okay, well, what is life? I can understand. Yeah, well, you know, well, the sex is is informed yet. We don't know if it's a boy or a girl. We, we, all these other, these all, you know, it's not formed yet. It looks like a, like a frog here, and it don't, we don't, you know, we don't know what it is or anything. Well, aside, all that aside, let's just go back to just something simple. Look at Leviticus seventeen eleven, and you you could understand how people would be going crazy right now for even saying something like that. Oh, well, who are you to say anything? Who are you to judge? You were never meant to med school. Look, I don't need all that. I just got God's word. That's all I need. And you'd be surprised at how many Christians would say, "Forget about that. I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to listen to science. <laughs> I'm going to listen to that doctor. I'm li like, okay, well then, then look, we got to part ways. We're not on the same mind. We're not on the same page. You know, you go follow that and and, and get all screwed up with, with all the rest of your beliefs. I'm just sticking with God's word. That's how we ought to be. Leviticus 7:11, 7, 17:11, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I've given, I've given it upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. That's the blood of, you know, of God, the blood of Jesus Christ. His bloodshed made an atonement, paid. That blood was valuable, obviously, and paid for our sins. Now the part of the verse is, the life of the flesh is in the blood. Okay, well, the moment you got the, a sperm cell and the, and the egg cell, and they come together, and the moment you got a blood cell, I don't know, it sounds like life. What is it, a boy or a girl? It, it's, not, it's nothing, it's life. <laughs> Period. It's life. Okay, just simple as that. Now, Isaiah 49. So, a couple, couple more verses. Isaiah 49. All right, let's look at some verses now here. Is that life in, in, in that mother's womb? Isaiah 49.1 Listen, O owls, unto me, and hearken, ye people, from far. The Lord hath called me from the womb. This is talking about Isaiah. I see that. The Lord hath called me from the womb. From the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. Um, and he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. Okay, so there, he hath called me from the womb. Well, what could you get aside from he's talking directly to Isaiah? Well, I would obviously see that God knows what's going on inside the wombs of women. Would you, would you think so? God knows what's going on inside the wombs of the woman. He, don't just, he just don't know what's inside the womb of Isaiah's mother. I believe this, this, this is applied maybe not to calling, or maybe not like the calling like John the Baptist, or special things like that. But there's other things that is true to the nature and character of God. Look at Isaiah 44, 24. 44, 24. And this is why I'm going to try to take his time to read all these verses. I think this, this will do us well to really just go through um, all these verses, these references that, that got listed here. Isaiah 44, 24. Because we ought to know how to answer things according to God's word. That's what's important. Isaiah 44, 24. Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that, look, maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens, that myself abroad, that, that, uh, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself. He had formed thee from the womb. Okay, the Lord formed thee. Obviously the Lord's the creator. No doubt he's not just forming Isaiah and, and John the Baptist. This would apply to he's forming 
all all babies, all things in the womb. Okay. Um, another one, Jeremiah. Jeremiah one five. Jeremiah one five. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. Before I formed thee, okay, he's talking to Jeremiah, in the belly I knew thee. Now let's, let's just pause and think. Okay, I could see he's talking to Jeremiah. But you mean to tell me that God doesn't form the rest of the babies? And you mean to tell me that God don't know that there's other babies in the womb? So, I, I mean, you can't be so strong on, well, it's just Jeremiah. And before camest out the womb, now I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto all nations. Yeah, that's Jeremiah. So obviously, you, part of that, not every single baby out there is ordained a prophet. But is, ev is every baby out there formed by God in the womb? Well, sure. I think that would be a fair thing to say. He just didn't form Jeremiah. He ordained just Jeremiah from the womb. So uh, no doubt God's in charge of what's going on inside the mother's womb. Look at Job. Look at Job. Like I said, Dr. Ruckman, he came out with this reference Bible in 2009. Um, who knows, at the, at the latter years of his life, did he, did he conclude, you know, uh, hey, look, this thing is, this is it's murder. Don't kill a, a, a baby, born or unborn. Um, you know, we're, we, we don't know for sure about what his thoughts were on that uh, in his latter years. Um... Look at Job chapter, what is it? Job chapter 3. Book of Job. You know, what, what am I going to do? Oh, Dr. Ruckman, he's wrong, so just forget about having no association. No, I'm still going to learn from the guy. I'm still going to esteem him as one of the greatest Bible teachers that ever America's ever seen. I mean, yeah, you got a lot of hate and there's a lot of things that, you know, I, don't, I wouldn't agree with him about, but, you know, still, just... Take some of it, you know, like you know, take the meat off the bone, throw the bones out. I mean, so there's some things that you got to watch out for. That's mankind in general, just but just to consult God's word on all things. That's what's more important. Look at Job chapter three, verse sixteen. Uh, Job says, "Or as an hidden, untimely birth, I had not been. As look what he calls them, as infants." which never saw light. I believe this is, uh, you know, look at Job, but he says in verse 11, Why died I not from the womb? Why did, I, why did I not give up the ghost when I came out of the belly? Okay, why did I not just, why was I even born? Uh, Job's question is, you know, his life and stuff. Um, you know, why, why, why was I even born in this world? I wish I would have just, you know, been like I had a miscarriage or died in the womb as an infant, which never saw light. Um, he's you know, talking about an infant there. Look at uh, look at Job ten eight. Job chapter ten verse eight. And I think this is a I think this is a good one because you can't conclude that he's just talking to Job here. Look at Job ten eight. Thine hands have made me, and fashioned me together round about. Yet thou dost destroy me. Yeah, Lord has yeah, Lord has power to give life, and He has power to take life. That's in the hands of God. So, uh, you know, your baby decides you have a miscarriage or something. You know, that's that's tragic. That's sad. Look, this is all God. Is, God's in charge of life. I'm not going to take it into my own hands, in the, in the sense of um, having a child and things like that. Uh, look at Ruth. Uh, look at Ruth. Look at Ruth, chapter one. Verse 11. Ruth chapter 1, 11. And Naomi said, Turn again, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there any more sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? So there she's saying, Are there any more sons in my womb? Well, son's a person. Son's a child. Um, let's see. All right, let's look at... Let's look at uh, Hosea. Let's look at a couple more on this. Hosea. Look at Hosea chapter 13. If I can find it. Here you go. Hosea chapter 13. 
Mary. Yeah. Where is that? Hosea. Hosea 13, verse 16. There ain't a 16. Oh, yeah, there is. Hosea 13, 16. Samaria shall become desolate, for she hath rebelled against her God, and they shall fall by the sword. Their infants shall be dashed in pieces, and their woman with child shall be ripped up. Now, that's, that's horrible. An infant getting dashed in pieces. Well, Job at one point in time said an infant that didn't see the light. So it could just be a, a baby in the womb. And obviously the other part, and, there, and a woman with child shall be ripped up. Now that's no good, obviously. And in the same, same verse, a word that, that sticks out is rebellion. And that's obviously what's going on in this day and age is it's rebellion against, against God, rebellion against His Word. Now I'm going to just close with something that's about... Um, well, my last section here, just give me 10 minutes at least. 10 minutes. Um, is people try to, they put all these reasons to try to justify an abortion. Okay, they're going to pull out reasons like what about, you know, rape cases? And what about if the mother's going to die? Or, you know, who are you going to kill if you're the husband or the man? Are you going to pick your wife to die? Or are you going to pick your baby to die? They're going to pull out all these exceptions to try to overthrow the, the established rule in general that it's wrong to take a life. So they try to take this, and that's obviously the inductive method of reasoning. Now, just a couple stats. The most recent U.S. maternal mortality ratio, mothers that die of giving birth, of 17.4 of 100,000 pregnancies represented approximately 660 maternal deaths in 2018. 660 maternal deaths. That's small. That's a small number. Um, compared to 900,000 abortions. So, okay, you, you know, if, if it would have been better off to take that infant's life to have that woman, that's a small case of 660. Okay, 660 compared to 900,000. Now, another couple other things, statistics about it on the Gutmacher Institute. 0.001% Okay, this reasons why people get an abortion. The pregnancy resulted from an incestuous relationship. How, how often does that happen? 0.01 percent. Okay, the woman, right, the woman's life was endangered by the pregnancy, which we just talked about. These exceptions that they say. 0.065 percent. The woman was raped. 0.085 percent. The woman's physical health was threatened by the pregnancy, 0.288%. The woman's psychological health was threatened by the pregnancy, 0.29%. There, there was a serious fetal abnormality, that happens 0.666%. Um, another thing, the woman aborted for social or economic reasons, 6% of people admit that, social or economic reasons. I don't want to care. I don't want my parents. What parents are going to think about me, or I can't afford it. You know, so that's what they say. Six percent, and in ninety-two percent, they had no reason. They elected no reason. Ninety-two percent. You know, because you know what the reason was, because they didn't want the responsibility of a child. Well, what do you mean? You're going to fool around. You're going to have sex and stuff. You're going to sleep around, commit fornication, with the word we should use, and yet they wanted no repercussion about. Now I gotta take care of a child. Now I gotta, you know, I gotta be a grown up. I gotta be a parent and stuff, because they they'd rather just enjoy that that pleasure for a season. The Bible says sin is pleasurable, but for a season, and they don't want to reap the consequences of that. Ninety two percent social reasons. Let's just close up with Titus, a couple verses. Titus chapter two. I'm gonna I'm probably have to cut a lot of this section out. Titus chapter two. I just wanted to address this because you know I don't. I'm not going to talk too much about, that's why I like enjoy our Bible studies, because we kind of get away from the world and all that, but it's, it's good to sometimes just, look, let's see what's going on, I'll establish it, you understand my position on it, and, you know, we'll, we'll move on from that. So look at, let's get this out the way. Titus chapter 2, verse 4. Titus chapter 2, verse 4. Now, one of the reasons was social reasons. You know, if you're responsible enough to join your body with somebody, 
and, 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 and join your flesh, join in flesh. If you're responsible enough to do that, well, then you're responsible enough to, to have a child. <laughs> I mean, really. Then you should be responsible enough to, to keep and, 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 uh, and raise that child. Because look at Titus chapter 2, verse... Uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 4. I right, look at verse 3. The aged woman likewise, they become behave, uh, behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. I mean, if, if any, any Christian woman that would advise, you know, yeah, just, just kill that kid. <laughs> I don't want your counsel at all. How could you be a Christian woman and say to any, I don't, even if you're, you know, you're 20 years old in your late teens, to say, yeah, you know, uh, from coming from a Christian woman, yeah, kill that, kill that baby in your womb. I can't, I can't see that. That's not, I don't think that's holiness. The verse 4, that they may teach the young woman to be sober, to, a, to love their husbands, all right, not to rebel against them, and to, and don't say to abort their children, it says to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home, good and obedient. Um, you know, and, and all that whole thing, I don't want to get into all this at a section on feminism. Write down 1 Samuel 15, 23, would be uh, feminism, and obviously that's a whole other study within itself, but that whole stuff is just a bunch of witchcraft at the end of the day, because it's, it's you're rebelling, you know, outside of your roles of what God wants you to be, okay? And that whole feminism stuff, it, it, that wrecks countries, uh, Samuel, 1 Samuel 15, 23, it says, uh, rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And I believe it says covetousness is as um, covetousness is as the sin of idolatry or something along those lines. But rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and people rebel against how God sets up the boundaries for men and the boundaries of women. Okay. Um, now I just, I always like this little, this little quote here. Uh, you know, the job of a Christian is to find the spirit of this age so this is a good thing here. Here's your job for a Christian. To find and identify the spirit of this age, okay, find it, and then go contrary to it. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that. So what's the spirit of this age? Well, when it comes to Christian churches and Christian people, the spirit of this age within the modern churches is just say everything positive. Say everything good. Tickle my ears. Tell me everything I want to hear. Tell me all about God's love. But exclude God's wrath, exclude God's judgment, don't talk about sin, don't talk about convictions. That's the spirit in modern Christianity, in which to go contrary to that. Okay, and then the spirit of the world is, um, the spirit of the world is, man, I was just thinking about it, there's a lot of them. Fear tactics, misinformation, dividing and conquering, rioting, rebellion. Uh, a, a, but the big one, a total despise of absolute truth and final authority. That's the spirit of the world. That spirit is creeping in, obviously, to modern churches. They despise absolute truth and final authority. Where to go contrary to that? And the other 92.99% um, reason, they, well, they had no reason. Well, the reason's fornication. They just want to, let's just look at that verse real quick. Look at, look at Hebrews. These are all verses to be familiar with. Hebrews. One of the big deals about the ab abortion is that they just, they want to enjoy sin without having repercussions associated with it. In other words, they're, they're well, it's going to wreck my life, it's going to ruin my reputation, and I'm too young, I don't have money, and so, so you're going to kill that baby because of what you did. It's wrong. It's wrong. Now listen, let me soften up for a little bit. If you, if anybody got an abortion, anybody listening over on the camera or whatever, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. Obviously, abortion isn't the unpardonable sin. I mean, God, God could save the most vilest offender, okay? But you think about it, you know, even when, let's say it was a newborn Christian, they just got saved, just got released, received the knowledge of the truth of what God did for him and all that, and yet got tangled up, and yet they got an abortion. Well, they better repent. I can't see them ever doing something like that ever again. <laughs> okay? But God forgives. Okay? He does forgive. And he's like, that's not some unpardonable sin. If you got an abortion, well, look what Paul said. Forget those things which are behind and reach forth. Okay? Because, you know, there's a lot of things about, you know, people getting abortions and it. it's just so sad and so troublesome. They better off just giving a kid up for adoption or something. You know, there's all the other alternatives. 
You know, I'll talk about that one thing where the husband had control about the, about the judgment, about his child getting, just got killed. When there's a woman, you know, uh, partners come together, they get an abortion, the, the, the woman don't want it, want it at all, she runs to the abortion clinic and the guy's out, the, the guy's out front crying and bawling his eyes out, broken hearted, because his son or his child is obviously going to get killed inside that clinic in there, inside the, the butcher house of, you know, the, the pyramid of Planned Parenthood and stuff. You know, it's no different than the Aztec Mayans killing babies and rolling their heads down the hill. I mean, it's barbaric. But, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, of, of sad stories like that. And it's, you get, you get an abortion, it messes up your body. Um, the health things that you may not be able to have a child again after that. I mean, I couldn't imagine, you know. Um, geez, I, I, praise the Lord, there's some, some girl did a study in, on abortion in high school. That, that teacher was like furious. Because she said, no, you got to take out these, you can't show these. And she showed them. <laughs> I was like, praise the Lord. And I think I'm now looking back on it. Yeah, because that stuff, I never, I couldn't imagine. That was the first time I ever was opened up to how they do that barbaric stuff and things. Um, so anyways, the 92.99% reason is indulging in the flesh. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 25. Hebrews 11:25. Uh, I'm almost done. I'm sorry. I'm almost done here. We got. Wow. I'm gonna just have to write you guys. I'm gonna just have to give you guys these verses. Hebrews 11:25. All right. Look at this. Hebrews 11:25. All right. This is Moses choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. You know, good godly people. Yeah. A, a woman gets has an abortion or has a child at a young age. Well, then a good godly family, I'm going to help you out. I'm going to be there for you. I'm going to help you take care of it. I'll help you get this out. I'll help you get some money. You know, we'll, we'll help you. All right? It's going gonna, it's gonna to be hard. You know, you're, it's going to be tough, but we'll give you a hand. Now, Moses, choosing rather to suffer the affliction of the people, uh, with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. That's what happens. People want to enjoy the pleasures of sin for that moment, not having to... Realize, man, this is going to mess me up later on down the road. Ended up, ended up having to kill a child inside of me. That's that's horrible. Um, write down Mark seven twenty. Mark seven twenty. The Lord talks about the heart. The Lord talks about uh, these things come from a heart. Murdering. Mark seven twenty. Um, write down. Uh, wow, this would be a good one to look at. Um, which, because I've read that message, what John Paul was going through, I think she something along the lines of uh, Psalm ninety-seven ten. You know, oh, you're preaching hate. You're preaching hate. <laughs> Look at Psalms ninety-seven ten. Psalms ninety-seven ten. Man, there's a lot. Psalms ninety-seven ten. Look what this says. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. I think we established that it's wickedness, it's abomination, it's, it's killing, you're taking a life. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Okay, you got to hate some things. You got to love what the Lord loves, you got to hate what the Lord hates. That's, that goes along with it. Uh, Proverbs, if you're in Psalms, go to Proverbs 8.13. Proverbs 8.13. I mean, could God really be in favor for taking a life of an unborn, innocent child. Okay? I mean, and it, it, people are always going to go to those exceptions. That's the inductive method of reasoning. Write that down and research that. Okay? Saying that the exception overthrows the established rule. For example, the established rule is men are stronger than women. Okay? The Bible says the woman's a weaker vessel. Men are stronger than women. Most people around the whole globe, you study throughout all history, that's a general statement. You never see a, 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 an army of... <laughs> ladies defending the country and taking over the world. It don't happen. Now, there's some ladies out there that will beat the pulp out of me. <laughs> All right? Now that's, now, that's an exception to the role that don't overthrow the established role. Do you understand that? That's called the inductive method of reasoning. Look that up. Compared to the deductive method of reasoning, which states, no, the exception actually proves the role. Okay? So th just get that. Except, there's, there's, just because there may be some sly exceptions... Don't mean that it overrides the, the, the normal uh, uh, agreement on, well, that thing's wrong, okay? Um, look at Proverbs 8.13. 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 Proverbs
the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And we're living in now, day and age, obviously evil was like nothing. People take a light look to it. They're so saturated with the things of the world, they're not saturating their minds with the things of God. Obviously, them people don't fear God. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Could you imagine the state of America for killing all those 900,000 babies? You, you know right away they're not fearing God. they got no fear of the Lord. Uh, Proverbs 6.16, 6, write that down. talks about shedding innocent blood. You want to do a word study? Psalms, or uh, type in innocent blood. Shows up 48 times in Scripture. So God has to deal with something. Well, life is in the blood. So therefore, innocent blood. No doubt that, that baby in the womb is innocent. Okay, Innocent life, innocent blood shows up 48 times. Um, Joel chapter 3 verse 19 God judges a land that sheds innocent blood well there's a good one Joel 3 19 um, man Psalms 127 verse 3 children are, an, are a heritage to the Lord the fruit of the womb is his reward that's a reward it's a blessing Psalms 127 verse 3 um, now I want to just look, I want to look at John fourteen six, John fourteen six. This will be the, the last concluding thought on it. John fourteen six. John fourteen six, and I'm gonna I'm gonna read Proverbs eight thirty six, which says, "But he that sinneth against me, wrongeth his own soul." All they that hate me love death. Now remember, start off on that verse that says people glory in their shame. Like we've seen one time, my wife showed me a picture of this cake, and it said that it's not a boy, but it's aborted. And they're, they're having a party. It don't, it don't, that don't fulfill that verse, and it, that, nothing that fulfills that verse any better, that people glorying in something as shameful as I just went and killed my kid, and let's have a birthday cake about it, or let's have a party about it. That's crazy. They glory in their shame. And that's, that's a sense, wow. You obviously must hate God, because the Bible says, all they that hate me love death. You're glorying in death. You love, what, do you love that? <laughs> that's horrible. Now look at Jesus, John 14, 6. He says, I am the way, the truth and the life. Okay? No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Jesus Christ is the life. If you're taking a life, you're going against the, the very essence of who Jesus Christ is. He's the way, He's the truth, He's the life. What, 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 what are you so, you know, what, why would you be so pro, I'm pro life? I'm pro life. I'm for life. Well, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth. He's the life. <laughs> Yet Christians out there want to say, I'm pro-choice. Well, you're against Jesus Christ. <laughs> you're pretty much against Him. Jesus Christ is the one that said, Suffer the children, little children to come unto me. You know, allow them to. Allow them to come unto me. For such is the kingdom of heaven. Lord, the Lord said, for the, like people like this, this is the kingdom of heaven. You'll be like an innocent child. These kids are innocent. Not like the Calvinists teach while they're going to hell. Jesus used them as an example and said, For such is the kingdom of heaven. Lord God, Lord God obviously loved little children. He gives them life. He's, he is the life. Okay? So, I just want to just conclude with all that in the same chapter, verse number 23. If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. Anybody out there that says that you, it's all right, it's okay, you can just go ahead and kill a kid, they don't love Jesus Christ. They don't love his words. I mean, I, I, I couldn't imagine. I mean, okay, look, they're sa if they're saved, Christians, they're so backslidden, they're so out of the will of God, I would run far from them and pray for them. I mean, you know, I understand this is a whole big uh, people debating and arguing. I mean, I don't really got time for that, okay? I mean, I, all, all, some people, look, you give them what the Bible says about it. If they don't want to listen to God's word, who, who in the world are you to change their mind? <laughs> You're not. If they don't want to listen to, God, to God's word, then... Just pray for them. Tell them, look, all right, look, you know, you don't want to listen to God's word, and then, then you know, that, that's on you, but you know, God's going to judge you for that, the judgment seat. So let's just bow our heads for closing prayer. 
Uh, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you continue to open up our eyes to your scriptures. I uh, just thank you, Lord, for uh, the Bible study tonight, Lord. I just thank you for um, just helping me, Lord, understand, you know, what, what is life. And I just thank you, Lord, that, that all the answers are found in the Bible. And, Lord, I believe that it's uh, that you that you want things simple. I believe, Lord, that you don't want us to always resort to science and philosophy and all the, the way that the secular world looks at things. I, I'm very grateful that we could just consult your book, Lord. And uh, as your word says, that... Um, that it's innocent, it's, it's, there's children in the womb, and obviously, Lord, it's not right. You don't have no, you don't have no enjoyment about seeing the death of an of a innocent child, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that you be with all the people, that if they did have an abortion, I pray that you just cleanse them, Lord. Cleanse them from the thought and allow them to press forward. Allow them to get up, Lord, and um, continue to live for you and, and continue to, to, to preach the the right things of your word, Lord, even if they went through something like that, I pray that they may use that situation to help others that are going through those situations as well, Lord. Uh, just, I just pray pray for all those people, Lord. Lift them up. Um, and we thank you, Lord. We give you all praise and glory this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. All righty. Jordan Middlebrook.